¿sabes qué? No somos las únicas, Katy y yo, hay un montón de gente que no estamos iguales, esto en todas partes te dicen, va a ser por Zoom, no es una crítica negativa, no más constructiva, ponerlo ahí enfrente donde dice Colorado Cave Association, no se preocupen, ustedes van a entrar por Zoom una vez, una cosa así simple, some language para la gente que es tecnológicamente menos instruida. Sí, lo, de la, lo de la plataforma es nuevo. Claro, o sea, lo que, lo, es el problema que siempre que uno hace algo, y yo también soy culpable, cuando yo hago algo ahora que enseño en línea, yo pienso que los papás entendieron y los papás no todas las veces entienden. Bien. Y también uh, desde las oficinas a veces se piensa que todo está claro y no, no está claro. No es tan claro, sí. <risa> Para los demás. Entonces nada más poner una... una como un paréntesis ahí, este, metas en el uva, ¿cómo se dice? ¿Juba? Uva. Juba. Juba. Mm. Póngale uva. <laughs> anyway, I'm glad you're here, Ana. I'm glad everyone is here. Thank you for joining us. Yes. Y hoy dejé a mi, a mi maravillosa para profesional, ella quiso enseñar igual y los papás no están apareciendo. Dijeron, nos tomamos el día sin vergüenza. <laughs> Mm -hmm. You have one live audience member of Manuel, Kathy? Yes, one live. <laughs> yeah, I hope he's not, you know, I hope I don't have to put him in timeout. Tell him no heckling allowed. No heckling, yeah, <laughs> especially not today. Person. Hello, Morena. Oh, there's so many people I haven't seen in such a long time. Hi. Mucho gusto en saludarla. Hello. Gracias, gracias. Siempre en camp. Luchando por el sí. idioma. Sí. Mucho gusto en verla. Igualmente. Gracias, gracias. But Kathy, we're about like one minute away from okay. starting. I just wanted okay. to welcome everyone. I am going to ask that everybody stays muted during the session and we will have some time at the end to for some Q&A. Please feel free to use the chat to ask some questions and we'll try to address as many as we can at the end. And I wanted to thank one more time, Dr. Kathy Escamilla for being here with us for this session. And Kathy, I'm going to let you introduce yourself if that's okay. Okay. We had 9.15 in about like 30 seconds. 30 seconds. So, so start or wait for 30 seconds. Let's give everybody like 10 more seconds to get okay. situated and I'm going to mute myself and it's all you. Okay. Okay. Well, buenos dias, everyone. Um, good to kind of see, see you all this morning. And um, I, um, I'm delighted to be here. I can't remember what, if this is my 100th Cave conference or my 25th or whatever, but I've been coming every year as long as I've lived in Colorado and that's been at least 31 years. So um, good to see you all. And um, I'm doing this presentation today actually because Valeria saw me do it at another uh, conference and invited me to apply. So I applied and I was lucky enough to get, the, uh, get my um, presentation accepted. So here we are. But um, I'm hoping that the, the uh, topic is something that uh, is of interest. Well, I think it's of interest to all of us because it's about the, the, the science of reading and how it applies to emerging bilingual learners. And uh, for those of us, you, most of you are too young to remember, but this is um, like the war in Afghanistan. It like never gets resolved and it never really goes away. And we always have troops stationed somewhere um, taking one side or another one. And so I, I, I hesitate to say, but I'm afraid to say that this is another version of where we've been before. Um, and my particular interest in this is emerging bilingual learners, whether they are in bilingual or dual language programs or whether they're in um, English medium programs, because I don't think the way that we teach them is the same as monolingual English learners, no matter 
what kind of program type they might be in. Okay, so as we get started, I would first like to kind of ask you um, how you're doing. So here's our first poll. How has your school year gone so far? And here are your choices. Fantastic, good, okay, not so good, or horrible. Uh, please pick one and then let's kind of see where, let's kind of gauge how we're all feeling. Yeah, I'm looking for the... Can you see the results? Yes, I can okay. see the results. So this is very interesting. Um, and I think it speaks to the resilience and the character of our teachers. So, you know, I, I, I think that I might have answered because I've um, experienced this through the eyes of my grandchildren, maybe okay or not so good. But wow, there's a couple of you who, in spite of everything, are going it. It's been fantastic. And maybe it's because you're just up for a challenge and you're really good people. A lot of you say good, which is, I just think, that's just wonderful and okay. I mean, if we can say this year is okay, I consider that to be a success uh, because we all know it's been less than ideal or the way that we would like to start off school and have school consistently. So I feel really good. Um, in the chat, um, since you're okay, good and fantastic, in the chat, I would like for you to um, just kind of put, what, what, what do you feel good about? this year. I mean, and even if, and nothing is too trivial. I feel good that, you know, I figured out how to do Seesaw. That's a lot. Uh, persevering. That's a wonderful thing to feel good about, that we are persevering, um, that we're surviving. What else do you feel good about? Relationships with students, staying flexible, that we're contributing. Absolutely. That, that, that it hasn't spread within our school. That is fantastic. That's been my prayer every um, day this year is that somebody at my children's, at my grandchildren's school doesn't get sick or that somebody in my family doesn't get sick. Going with the flow, practicing boundaries. Um, you, you all are just wonderful. I mean, um, keep moving forward, a new community. Close, more closely with mothers than ever. And I think that a lot of people have realized this, um, how much our parents really do help and how much they're involved, um, that we're back in person, absolutely. So I, I wanna congratulate you on having survived and thrived. Um, and you know, hopefully we're on the downside of this pandemic, we don't know. We have to keep working, at, but we're all changed and in some ways changed for the better. I know that we hadn't planned on doing this, but I'm amazed how quickly the education system was able to pivot and get into teaching online and doing it by October, I would say with my grandchildren, we were into a routine that we could understand. Um, and boy, that was really different than last April. So congratulations, everyone, good work. Okay, now we have this, could we go on? Um, I have one more poll before we get started. I wanna know what type of program you work in. And remember, this is a COCAVE conference. And so we're particularly we're interested in emerging bilingual learners. So I'd like to know if you work in an ESL or an ELD, if you work in ELD or a sheltered content, if you work in some kind of bilingual program, or if you work in dual language one way or two way, I see you're answering. I'm reading this, but I, I see that you all can read very well. Um, interesting. I'm looking at the results are coming in. And it's about, okay, so um, what I'm looking at is that about, about 46% of you work in some kind of bilingual option. And I'm counting dual language and bilingual in one category. And uh, about a third of you work in some kind of English medium program 
and 19% um, of you work in other, and I wish I could ask you more of what that other is, but I don't have time right now because we have to uh, we have to move right along. But so um, the way I planned this, it, it seems like it's going to work because the first half of the session, I'm going to talk about what we know about research-based practices for people who are working in in English medium and by English <coughs> medium programs, I don't necessarily mean English only. I mean where English is the language of instruction for most of the school day um, and the academic content that kids are getting. So, and then the, so I'm gonna talk about that. And then the second part of the time, talk about bilingual and dual language options and, and what we know about the research. Um, but I'm gonna say this to start and then ask Valeria to move on. Um, to start, I'm going to say that um, we know that a child's native language or their uh, home language or their language other than English, lote, as it has come to be called, that that is never, never, never a problem or a source of interference. And it can be incorporated in any kind of school program, no matter what your language of instruction is. And that's real different than the old days when we used to think that if a kid spoke a non-English language in school, that would confuse them or slow down their um, acquisition of English. That isn't, that isn't true. Okay, so let's get started. Here's what we know. Um, and if you have questions, put them in the chat and we'll try to stop periodically and answer them. Um, we know that literacy acquisition for emerging bilinguals is both alike and different than teaching monolingual English bilingual children in English medium settings. So it's both alike and different. So how is it alike? All languages have directionality, whether it's Chinese or English or Arabic and English, they all have directionality. It may be different directions. Some languages go up and down, English goes left to right, Arabic goes right to left, but all languages have directionality. They are not um, random. We know that in the case of Spanish and English, Spanish and English share an alphabetic principle. And so um, they have that in common. We know that literacy is rule governed and symbolic. Those little squiggly things, no matter in what language, on a piece of paper or now more and more on a computer mean something. And those symbols go together to make words, words go together to make thoughts and thoughts go together to make stories and make arguments and make research reports. So literacy is rule governed and symbolic. That's what they have alike. Okay, Lydia. But there are also some important differences. Um, so first, English monolingual kids are exposed exclusively to English both in and out of school. They may go to Walmart and hear Spanish, but they likely don't pay attention to it. They may go somewhere where music is played in another language, but believe it or not, monolingual English speaking kids don't much pay attention to other languages. So they have exclusive access to one language, both in and out of school. They are speaking and learning the language of status and prestige, you all know that, um, and power, both in and out of school. They have only one linguistic resource. Now, that we may think that that makes it easier to teach them to read, um, maybe, but they don't have the gift of knowing two languages. And we need to be more a little more assets based in our orientation about kids who come to school with two languages. Um, they can understand, this is the most important thing, they can understand teacher instructional language. So when a teacher might say to them, here, uh, clap, the number of sounds that you hear in this word. And then you say, and the word is children. Kids who know English know all of that and know that the only thing they have to pay attention to is children and clapping because they understood the instruction. Kids who come to school not speaking English have to try to figure out what the heck the teacher just told them to do. They, the children who only speak English can understand teacher instructional language and second language learners um, ha, need to learn teacher instructional language while they're learning to read. Now, the most important thing probably, and a place where um, unfortunately our state and other states are headed is that reading programs and assessment systems have been developed for them and for their language. So they have the advantage that the programs, the stories they're gonna read and the tests they're going to take have been developed for them and their language. Okay, so that's those are monolingual kids. Now, how about emerging bilingual kids? How about emerging bilingual students? 
Um, they use and hear at times um, English and other languages in school at, and at home and in the community. So they have two linguistic resources to draw on to solve problems of communication. This is only a problem if we see it as a problem and we see it as a source of interference, but this is not a cognitive problem. Um, we have tons of research that debunks that myth. Emerging bilingual students use both of their linguistic resources when producing and interacting with texts. But English only programs instruct and assess as if the students are monolingual. So um, I could ask you um, to, to put examples. Most of you probably can think of, of one, but I'm gonna give you some examples a little bit later on of how students are using both of their linguistic resources um, to try to solve the, the issues of decoding words and putting words together to make, um, to make sentences. But let's not forget that at the middle of all of this or at the center is meaning. Um, students also use translanguaging strategies, but these are often seen as signs of confusion. Um, so if a teacher says, let's clap the sounds to a word, and a student turns and says to a peer, ¿Qué dijo? Sometimes we say, stop, don't do that. It's English time. So what the kid is asking for is clarification. What did the teacher say? Clarify for me what the heck I'm supposed to do. We often see that as a sign of confusion when it's not. Uh, emerging bilingual kids have to understand teacher instructional language as well as how to decode words. They're re, uh, asked to acquire proficiency in English when they have not acquired oral English proficiency. So one of my biggest fears about the, the um, ongoing war in Afghanistan, I mean the United States around reading, is that um, we have school districts who are gonna say, all we need to do is the science of reading and we no longer need ELD. Wrong, 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 wrong. Did I say wrong? I'm gonna say it again. Kids have to learn oral English proficiency while they are learning to read in English. If that is your program of instruction, you cannot take away ELD and expect to have success. Um, emerging bilingual kids interpret their world through both of their cultures. So it's not just a language um, issue, it's a cultural issue. And we know that there's a lot of cultural bias in reading materials. So I'm gonna give you a couple of examples and then we're gonna go on, but wait a second, Valeria, before you advance the slide. So a um, uh, long time ago in Literacy Squared, we were using these um, uh, reading materials and the kids uh, had, uh, they gave their older brother, the older brother and sister gave their younger brother and sister hand-me-down clothes. And none of the kids could understand what hand-me-down clothes were because after all, culturally, these were Spanish-speaking kids. The clothes don't belong to any one kid in the family. They belong to whoever the, they fit. And so the idea of hand-me-down, the kids knew hand, hand-me-down collectively means a concept. So it doesn't do me any good if I can decode the words. If I don't understand that I've got to use all those words together, I'm not going to get to meaning. So um, I have a couple of examples of, of culture things uh, because I think it's time that you're probably all ready for some, um, uh, something that's a little lighter. So Valeria, how many of you seen the Bernie memes or you saw them right after the, the uh, inauguration. Well, I loved immediately on Facebook how quickly uh, the Latino community picked up the Bernie memes and made them cultural. So all of a sudden, here's Abuelito Cafe instead of Abuelita, and there's Bernie right there with his mittens and everything and his arms crossed. So that's, what, that cult, that's a cultural interpretation of a meme. There's another one I like too, uh, because uh, go ahead, Valeria. Um, find Bernie. See, he's the third row, he's number 14, and he's El Bernie, El Bernie. Um, he's a, now a Loteria card. Um, so that's a cultural interpretation. We always, when we are exposed to more than one culture, we have our cultural, our cultural values to use in interpreting and reading text and interpreting what the teacher says and what is going on. Um, okay, so let's go on, Valeria. Okay, so. When I think about my emerging bilingual learners, think about your own kids and uh, knowing that this, this year is a one-off, uh, but hopefully you've had time to interact with them. I would like for you to tell me uh, what you think that learning to read in English is their biggest challenge. Learning letter names, learning letter sounds, 
putting sounds together, reading fluency, or understanding what they've read. I don't always know how to read these polls because sometimes they go up and they go down. So it, before we go on, please note that you are all right, right on. I mean, in a way it's all, if, if the language is unfamiliar to you, if I were to have to try to learn Russian tomorrow, I would be challenged to learn the letter names and to learn the sounds they make and to see how they're put together. And I would certainly be challenged with being a fluent reader. But the most, the thing that would most challenge me would be understanding what I'm reading. So 71% of you said understanding what you're reading. Um, I'm going to say this a couple of times uh, because this is important to remember that um, the last synthesis of research that we have had from the National Reading Panel on Second Language Learners um, in 2006 um, said this, second language learners learn to decode at equal rates uh, with native English speakers. What they could not do in fourth and fifth grade was comprehension and writing. They didn't understand what they were reading, but there was no evidence that they were behind their native English speaking counterparts in, um, in learning to decode words. Okay, so 71% of you are exactly right. Where we see down the road that we have our biggest challenges are with comprehension. You see Validia is moving me on here. Okay, so what we have now, as if you haven't heard, and my guess is you have heard, that we're engaged again in another um, big reading debate about um, how we should teach, especially initial reading. And um, we have something called the science, and I'm gonna put it in quotation marks, of reading telling us that um, there is a causal link between learning to decode words, learning how to um, decode words and learning to understand. There is no causal link. No one is arguing against teaching kids uh, part to whole strategy, but there is no evidence that there's a causal link. So we're acting it like if kids don't learn certain foundational skills, they will never be good readers. There, that, that assumes a causal uh, link that isn't there, that just isn't there. So we're once again engaged in this debate. Um, and someone said, can we get that quote somewhere? Um, and I don't know which quote it is, but I'll be happy to, I'm reading the, the chat. I'll be happy to try to get it for you. So, okay. So Valeria, would you move on? And maybe this is what you're looking for. So initiatives designed to improve reading instruction need to consider research on bilingual learners. And this may be what you were looking for. August and Shanahan in developing literacy and second language learners, everything I'm gonna say here is on the PowerPoint and on a reference list that are the two last slides in the presentation. So um, it's, all, it's all here because I'm not quick enough on the draw to put this in the chat, you understand? I'm lucky to even be reading off of the slides. Um, so word level literacy skills, this is what August and Shanahan found. Word level literacy skills like decoding word recognition and spelling were attained in comparable levels by monolingual English speakers and language minority students. That was the word they used. Comprehension and writing were identified as areas of struggle. So we don't need to drop everything and do more phonics more often for more minutes and more days of the week and then open up a Saturday school to practice all this stuff when it doesn't work because we already have evidence that second language kids tend to be become decoders. What they have struggle with is comprehension and that involves learning oral language, learning how to put language together, learning what all of this means. Okay, so the research results are not equal for bilingual and monolingual learners. We don't have evidence that the new science of reading people have updated their research base um, and it, to include um, emerging bilingual kids. Okay, Valeria, let's move on because I'm afraid I'm going to run out of time here. Okay, so what you hear these days is a whole lot of um, criticism of something called the three queuing systems. Um, as having been ineffective for monolingual English students. But we have some evidence from a colleague at, at UC Boulder, and I really invite you to read any of her work. Her name is Sylvia Noeron Lu, and I have a, a reference for her on the, 
in the reference page um, that actually the three queuing systems might be essential for emerging bilingual kids. And this may be an important difference between teaching monolingual kids and second language kids. So notice the three queuing systems include semantic meaning, which is uh, semantic cues, which are meaning, uh, language structure cues, which are hard for second language kids because language is ordered in a different way in English than they are in other languages, and then phonics and the visual cues. So um, it's not that phonics is absent in what we're doing now. It's one of three cueing systems, but it has been widely criticized as being um, uh, ineffective. So let's go on, Valeria. Okay, so I want to give you an example. Um, a colleague that I've grown to be a fan of hers, her name is Laura Asense Moreno, um, gave, the, gave us this example. So a child orally reading this passage and a teacher doing a running record, uh, which a, a, a will not be used anymore under the science of reading. We will no longer use running records to assess children's reading. And we're going to lose a lot by not uh, using running records. Again, I'll be happy to answer questions, any, any questions you have. So here's the child reading, doing the running record. One day, the little boy was going to take his bath. He saw a bird on the ground. The child read the word bird as beard, which frequently happens. We know that vowels are vexing um, in any second language. They are vexing for me in Spanish. They're vexing for Spanish speaking kids in English. From a strictly phonics perspective, the child did not read the word correctly because being correct and not making good approximations is everything in the science of reading. And so it could be inferred that he didn't have the vocabulary because he read the word bird as beard, it was inferred that he didn't have the vocabulary. However, when the teacher asked the child what the word was, the child said pajaro. Clearly the child had the vocabulary and understood what the word was. So the issue was a pronunciation issue, not a vocabulary issue and not a fluency issue. If we get rid of the three queuing systems and we get rid of running records and we only look at kids as if they decode every word as if they were native speakers of English, we are likely going to underestimate what these children are learning and doing. And we can't afford to do that because we've already underestimated them for the last 30 years. Okay, Valeria. Um, so phonics is not enough. So what's this child eating? Um, hint, you see the little picture there, the little boy? Hint, the teacher says, it starts with an S and makes this down. Now what's the right answer? I should have you all write it. Um, the right answer is spaghetti. But what does the child say? Sopa. Now, did the child use the cues? Did the child know the sound? and the letter name and the sound, what that looks exactly like sopa that he may eat, sopa that I may make. And I also make spaghetti um, every few years or so. Okay, so the point is this, as teachers make instructional decisions for bilingual students, a single monolingual view of literacy is not enough to support literacy development. And I think we should all, uh, Espaghetti, yes, Jessica Martinez, it's espaghetti, of course. Um, so could I just stop for a minute, Valeria, and read a couple of um, messages from the chat. Uh, so I'm trying to read the 9010 modeling. The science of reading folks want us to significantly increase the amount of time spent on literacy in English. Here's my one line answer to, I've heard this now for about 10 times. Show me your research. We'll show you our research. You show us yours. And um, you know how they say on TV, repeated attempts to contact so-and-so has resulted in no response. So I have made repeated attempts to um, contact people who are saying stuff like this and say, please show me your review of literature the, and your empirical research that shows me that in fact, what you're saying is an effective practice. They don't have it, folks. They don't have it. Um, okay, would love to know your thoughts on teaching more phonics in L1. Um, so uh, phonics in L1, uh, when we get to, to, um, span, to dual language, uh, I'm going to address that. But nobody is against phonics teaching. We're against phonics taking over the entire reading program. We're against phonics at the expense of. Um, okay, 
Now, uh, let's see here. Let's go on because otherwise I'm going to run out of time. This is so much fun. I'd rather be having a, a conversation. All right. So I want to um, talk a little bit about a re review of research that um, I recently did with a colleague, um, Sandra Butvalaski, colleagues, um, Dina Gumina and Elizabeth Silva. Um, and it was published in our RQ. And again, all of this is on your uh, uh, resources. Uh, we looked at 67 uh, potential studies because what we wanted to look at was did dibbles in English have a differential impact on emerging bilinguals from native English speakers. And uh, so what we found was that uh, most of the studies with dibbles that had English learners in them did not disaggregate data. They would make blanket claims like all kids grew in this study. And it was true when you looked at the disaggregated data, all kids grew but emerging bilingual students did not grow as much as native English speakers, meaning the program didn't have an equal impact. The program had less of an impact on emerging bilingual kids. And um, when there was an impact, it was more uh, likely to be with intermediate students than beginners. So clearly, and we know there's a difference between kids who are brand new to the language and kids who have some experience. Okay, so we studied, um, we looked at 15 studies that looked at differential outcomes between monolingual English and emerging bilinguals. And again, in studies, both groups made gains, but emerging bilinguals did not grow as fast as monolingual English. There is very little research, and here's the bottom line. There's very little research on the predictive validity past the third grade. We can teach kids to pass a Dibbles test, but we, that doesn't necessarily translate into comprehension in the fifth grade. Okay, so in, let's, let's move on. So emerging bilingual kids in English medium programs, if you're not teaching bilingually, kids still need oracy. They need oral language development and they need oracy. They need writing and they need meta language development. You know what, that kid that said SOPA, that is a good approximation. I say, you know, SOPA, yeah, you call it SOPA, you know what, we call it spaghetti. Espaghetti, we call it espaghetti. Um, and so we need that across language metalinguistic development, even if we're only teaching in English, because that helps kids understand the differences in their language. We need to read for meaning and not just decoding. And children need to see themselves in the curriculum. So they need to have books that look like them. We need to have first language, their first language is valued in the classroom, even if English isn't the medium. I'm gonna say this really loudly and then I'm gonna give you some examples of what scares the heck out of me. Um, uh, phonics was always meant, even in the 1950s when I was a, a kid in elementary school, it was always meant to be short-term and not to extend past the third grade, always. It was the short-term to get you started, to get you into the program, but it was never meant to be a long-term uh, program that saw you through high school and college. Okay, so um, let's move on, Valeria. All right, so I know you can probably can't see this because I can't see this, but this is, this is what scares the bejesus out of me about what, what is being proposed. Um, this is a recommended time allocation for reading instruction for all students, and it's from the state of New Mexico. We haven't seen one yet from our state, but I don't doubt that it'll be very different. Please notice when um, these people suggest that we start teaching phonics to kids when they're infants. Holy cow, in between breastfeeding, I guess we're supposed to teach letter sounds um, and preschool. Notice that this plan goes all the way through the 12th grade. My God, if you don't have it by then, I don't know. Um, maybe we need a different method. The part I want you to pay close attention to, however, is the part that most of you are probably most um, worried about, and that's K to three. And uh, I have K to three at, um, on the next slide, Valeria, if you'd move it to the next slide. Okay, so notice the K three example. This is what is being suggested. A 90 minute reading block, not a 90 minute literacy block, a 90 minute reading block. Um, so I, my question I asked, is this to increase to 180 minutes in bilingual or dual language? But the 90 minute reading block is dedicated to providing instruction on the five essential elements of beginning reading, phonological awareness, phonics, fluency, 
vocabulary and comprehension. These are the very same things that the National Reading Panel suggested in the year 2020, uh, 2000. And so if the last 21 years have been successful for us, I guess we can go on doing the same thing we've been doing for 21 years. But if they haven't, then maybe we shouldn't follow this plan. In addition, the plan says in New Mexico, additional instructional time will be needed to be scheduled to ensure adequate time to teach other areas of literacy such as writing and um, oral language. So neither of the two things that second language learners need the most are included in this plan. 90 minutes. Um, 90 minutes should be provided to students. Uh, oh, and then it says for kids in grades three, K to three, more than 90 minutes should be provided to students who have not met grade level reading goals. And we know who that is. We know that that's likely to be kids who are second language learners. Okay, be scared, be worried, be very, very worried. Okay, let's go on, Valeria. All right, now, what the last thing I'm gonna say about this, now we're gonna go on to dual language uh, and bilingual approaches is that um, how do we use the, what has become to be called LOTE, a language other than English, to teach in English medium programs? Um, first, we know that we need to strategically use a child's first language if we can. What the teacher said when she said, sit down is siéntate. That's a strategic use of language. That helps kids understand what the heck they're supposed to do. We need to provide parents materials and books in Spanish that mirror what kids are supposed to be learning in English so that they know how to help. Um, we need to use that non-English um, language to manage the classroom and to communicate with parents. And we should never ever censor a child's non-English language or make them feel bad because they don't speak English. And the lote is a part of a child's identity. Um, and we, even if we're only teaching in English, we have to keep those things in mind. Okay, Valeria, next. Okay, now it's time to chat, or as we call chisme, or sometimes we call it charlar. So in the chat, share one thing you've learned so far that you might want to share at your school or a question that you have. You, you can start typing now. I wish we could all talk. That's the one thing about this medium that I really don't like. Yeah. Um, wow, wow, now they're coming in. Whoa, whoa, go, go. Uh, I, so help, I, I wanna, I, um, yeah. Yeah, uh, so let me just, I, I wanna pick out some of these, but they're going so fast. So I'm gonna ask my friends, uh, Wendy and Valeria to help too. So um, yes, um, do not underestimate the value of good oral language teaching and oracy instruction. And yes, no one is saying that we don't need phonics. We're just saying that that isn't all we need. They need phonics plus a whole lot more. And that should, should, should be um, a part of a program, but not the whole program. Um, let's see, the three Q systems, um, more focus on writing and oral language, absolutely. Um, Somebody, the cultural, you, you can't underestimate the, the cultural value and what the kids are bringing culturally with them. Um, okay, Valeria, you choose one. And you, then you, Wendy. Um, I didn't know there was a discouraging attitude towards using running records and the three queuing systems. Oh yeah, yeah, no, that's, uh, that's um, and again, I think we need to be honest about things that we have noticed that haven't worked for our kids. So for example, um, in Literacy Squared for years, we've been saying that we, we are worried about reading Reader's Workshop and Writer's Workshop, that it provides too much unstructured time for kids, that perhaps explicit and direct instruction would be a better use of some of this time for kids. So it's not that we're saying everything that's been done is perfect and we don't need to change. It's the, the kind of change and the, the um, assumption and, uh, with research that we don't have that what will work for English speaking kids will work for uh, kids who are learning a second language without being challenged. That's pretty um, scary. Wendy? 
Um, yeah, how about um, making sure that the science of, it's skipping on me now that more are coming in. Um, where did it go? Uh, making sure that the science of reading movement does not overrun our literacy development. Find a balance and protect it. And then there was also something that kind of goes with that, but about the idea of, um, you know, phonics and do we like not skipping it all together, but, but finding that balance, if you want to. Right. To that. Yeah. No one not skipping it all together is not the message here at all. It's putting it in its proper place. That's the so putting it in its proper place should not mean. Be, be, it should not be in our state an existential threat to people who are teaching literacy in Spanish, and I'm afraid it is. It should not mean revising teacher education programs so that reading methods courses become all about teaching phonics and not about all of the other things that we know. Um, it, so it should not mean, it should not mean that every single teacher has to take some um, class. I mean, none of us mind learning, we're all lifetime learners. Uh, but it, it's this total overhaul and overturn of reading instruction that, again, we probably, I wouldn't mind if it included oral language, it included writing, it was robust and comprehensive and included cultural considerations and teaching for social justice. Um, I wouldn't mind that. But what we have is a, a very narrow look at what it means to be a reading teacher. And I'm very worried for new teachers about what that means. So let's move on. We'll do more cheese mando later on. So what about dual language? So we've talked about what, what about, so it can't just be, we don't teach bilingual. So we're gonna do what the science of reading says, no, no, and no. Because kids who speak another language are different. And any coach from CDE or any other agency who tells you good teaching is good teaching does not know what they're talking about. Again, here's my word for the day. Show us the research. Show us your research, we'll show you ours. Show us the research. Now, it may be, if you're a first year teacher, it won't make you popular with your principal. We all know what that's about and we'll support you. But some of us who've been around for a while can help you fight this battle. Okay, so what about bilingual or dual language options? So the one I know the best is Literacy Squared. I've been working with this for a while, and, and Wendy maybe knows a thing or two about this too, as do other people. Uh, but for the last 16 years, we've been working on this particular bilingual and dual language option that I just want to share you because I think it's fair to say, okay, so if you don't like this, what do you recommend? So, okay, Valeria. Okay, so should we do bilingual education or shouldn't we? Um, when the folks come saying, maybe you shouldn't do Spanish reading anymore, we don't have any evidence. Um, so I'm gonna give you the example. Bilingual education is settled science. We do have the research. I'm giving you there with apologies to the people that I've left out, a few of the more prominent um, syntheses of research that show us that bilingual education is the most effective um, program. Now you can't do it, you can't do it, we know. We're all gonna to try to help you be the best teacher you can, but please know that there is a world out there where there is research to, to support what we're saying is a good option, particularly for Spanish speaking kids. Having said that, we know that about 87% of the kids in Colorado are in English medium programs. They are not in bilingual programs. So I'm gonna, I, I don't think anybody from Aurora Public Schools is here, so I'm gonna throw them under the bus. I'm really not, but I think they're indicative of a whole lot of other school districts. In Aurora Public Schools, 77% of their seventh graders who carry the label English learner have been in no other school district. These are not kids who have moved in and out or moved around. They have been in Aurora and no other place for the last eight years since they started kindergarten. Of those 77% of the kids, 80% of them carry the label long-term English learners. These are kids who have only had English medium programs. They have been dibbles to the, uh, to the nines. They've been dibbled every year. Um, they have gotten scripted reading programs. Um, they have gotten the most boring versions of ELT, probably that man or woman or somebody created. So these are not kids who have been poisoned from bilingual education. These are kids who were in only English programs. If 
getting rid of bilingual education is the answer, then all those kids in Aurora should be doing just fine. And Aurora is just one example. We're just now starting into a look at, in my free time, I'm supposed to be retired, but in my free time, uh, we're just now starting to look at other school districts. So we know that bilingual education is a, a settled science. Okay, so don't let them try to talk you out of that. All right, now um, here's a framework and the framework lays English and Spanish side by side. It's called a holistic biliteracy framework. And notice that there are two little um, circles on either side. One says Spanish literacy and one says literacy-based ESL. I know a lot of you have seen this, but what I wanna do is take some time to put where I think phonics would fit in this framework and where it's always been. Um, on the Spanish side and on the English side, in the circles, you see little icons. Um, the little icons with the kids talking to each other represent oracy. Um, the pencil represents writing. The book represents reading. And the little idea cloud represents metalinguistic development. Okay, that we need to do in both Spanish and both English. We also need to help kids connect their languages so they figure out how their languages are alike and different. And we need to do that by making sure that somehow we're connecting their literacy environments. So it's not English over here and um, Spanish over here. I worry um, about the all English environments that we're gonna have ELD, the schools that are lucky enough to keep it and reading and they're not gonna be connected at all, which is not, doesn't make any sense. Okay, so go on Valeria. So look at the little thing that says reading. And before I go on, where I see that phonics could fit very nicely in a bilingual program is in the reading time where we have it as 25% of a whole literacy program, it could easily be 25% of the reading program. That is not a 90 minute block a day. That's probably about 20 minutes or 30 minutes if people insist. But if you're gonna do that and you do a good job of phonics, that should be enough. If you have a good phonics program in both English and Spanish, and I'm gonna say, what scares me is the, trans, the potential translation of phonics programs in English into Spanish that won't make any sense for kids and that are not um, aligned with the internal structure of the language. So that's where I see the, the phonics. And I think that we could do some research on that. Um, now see, Liz Blake, that's a very good question. Are you advocating for whole group phonics lessons? In the early elementary grades, I think that that could actually happen. Um, and then, you know, because the purpose of this um, is to, okay, so I'm gonna say a couple of things. Thank, Liz Blake, um, thank you, this is a great question. I hope it doesn't get me too far off of the, uh, off of my uh, script here because I, we gotta finish at a particular time. But so um, here, uh, uh, yes, whole group phonics lessons, yes, could happen. Um, and then do something extra for the kids who aren't getting it. So don't start out saying, man, these kids are way, way low. We're gonna have to give them something different. No, start out assuming they're all gonna do okay. Um, and, um, and then whole group in Spanish and then whole group in English, but it shouldn't be the same lesson. Um, Literacy Squared, by the way, on our website, literacysquared.org, we have a statement on the science of reading in dual language and bilingual programs. It's short. Um, and that's why I'm recommending it to you because I know how busy you all are. Um, so yes, uh, phonics uh, lessons in whole group, that's a good idea. And within the reading time so that you still have time to do all these other things that are so important to building a literacy program and not a reading program. Okay, Valeria, off we go. So here's the, um, we know that teaching students to read in their first language and Lotte we're using now more because a lot of kids don't come to school with a first language. They come to school as simultaneous bilingual uh, learners. So Lotte seems to fit so that we don't talk about an L1 or L2. Um, we know that that promotes higher levels of achievement in English. Okay, next. Um, so the, the second part is writing. I mentioned that to you. I'm going to have to hurry. Um, okay, go ahead, Valeria. Uh, go on. Children can learn to read, to write in two languages at the same time without becoming confused and without impeding progress in either. We know that. There's good research. Um, whenever somebody says there's a gap in achievement between English learners and the rest of the state, nobody says it's because we're doing ELD badly. But people frequently say, 
question bilingual education. Okay, let's see here. Um, okay, so um, in Literacy Squared, this is a look at a child writing in two languages, where if you only looked at English, this is one of my favorite examples because I like the, the illustrations. Uh, but if you only looked at English, you might say, boy, this kid, and, and I'm gonna go a step further. And again, I mean no disrespect to people who are monolingual in English. However, I don't go to, to if my lungs are hurting, I don't go to a knee doctor. I go to a lung doctor. And when we're looking at bilingual kids, we need bilingual eyes looking at what they're producing. And if I can't do it, I need to get help from a colleague. So pretend like you're just looking at this child's um, English writing sample and pretend like you only speak English. Okay, so the child is asked to write about her favorite toy. She says, my favorite toy is a bunny and G dance. My mom give it in Christmas. A love Gwen E dances. A love Jim so much. G moves G's R's when G dances. My bunny is white. Now, what do you think? Now, here is, again, very, very, very concerned about kids producing stuff like this, which we know is a normal part of the developmental trajectory of an emerging bilingual kid and saying, this kid needs more phonics. No, this kid needs bilingual interpretation of what she's writing. Now, let me read it to you as a bilingual. My favorite toy, my favorite toy is a bunny. And he, because we know that J makes the <laughs> sound, he dances. My mom gave it in Christmas. I love when he dances. I love him so much. He moves his ears when he dances. My bunny is white. Now, are we okay if this kid's writing like this in fourth grade? Absolutely not. But we know in first grade, this is normal developmental progress for kids who are learning Spanish and English at the same time and are using two linguistic resources to solve the problem of communication in writing. Now, what else do we have here that helps us understand how really talented this kid is? We have his writing sample in Spanish. And from Spanish, we can see that a lot of the things, the phonics things that we might be worried about in English are actually language issues. They are not reading issues. And it's incumbent upon us to help with that. Okay, let's go on, Valeria. Um, so what do we know? At the discourse level, this child's got voice and organization in both languages. At the structural elements, the, chil the, the child uses um, Spanish syntax. Uh, my mom gave it in Christmas. At the word level, this is where pronoun use. The child says his when he means its and G when he means he and it. So we have some pronoun issues. These are not issues that are going to be solved by teaching phonics or phonological awareness or vocabulary. This is language teaching. Okay, let, and phonics on the next slide. So what we see are what we would call Spanish influenced phonics. So words like favorite and he and give it and I, all of these things is uh, the, the child can write. And if we can read bilingual, we can figure out what the child says. And then there are common issues that kids, English speaking kids also make like Christmas and dances and moves in white. Now, what can we do that might help this kid that would be better than 90 minutes spent on phonics instruction? Valeria, da da da. We can, we can create, uh, um, we can do a dictado. We made a list of our favorite toys. Here's our dictado. Da Danny wanted a truck because he, now notice the blue, Danny and he. We are teaching pronoun agreement, um, which is something that the child needs. We're not teaching, <laughs> eh, <laughs> or my favorite, to hat, to hat. No, the word is that. Okay, but uh, stay tuned because this will be coming to a school near you because he says it goes fast. It is uh, agrees with truck. However, Maya wanted a transformer because she says it is the coolest toy ever. So you see what we need to do there and how we can teach reading fluency, meaning, 
pronoun agreement that second language learners need all in one little dictado, a much better use in writing of our 20 minutes than 90 minutes of practicing um, uh, uh, word letter sounds. Okay. Uh, okay, so what, could I stop just a minute? Lina Castellanos, I love your question. I teach fourth grade and my kids write like that in English. How should it be addressed? Yes, it should be addressed. And too often, <laughs> I think that, um, and I, I don't, I would never say that we should be mean to kids ever, but I do think that explicitly we need to point out to them, that's not right. And here's the right way we're gonna do it. So we need to say, you know, you know what? I really like that you, you wrote X. However, this is the way we write it in English. Doesn't mean it's wrong, um, but if, in fourth grade, it's high time. We, when we first started Literacy Squared, we saw kids who wrote house, um, H-U-S in first grade, and we're still writing it H-U-S in fourth grade. That isn't what we're talking about here. We're talking about development. And so at developmental level at first grade is not the same as fourth. And my guess is, Lena, that your kids have practiced it wrong for a lot of years and have, have, have habituated the, the incorrect uh, spelling and usage. Okay, so, but these are language issues. These are not reading issues. These are not phonics issues. Okay, ah, you're welcome, Lena. Okay, let's go on. So oracy. So oracy, the way we define it in Literacy Squared means teaching the oral language skills and structures that are necessary for a child to be successful with a literacy objective. Um, and so again, what we talk about are oracy or oral language. These are productive skills and these are the hardest skills to learn in a second language. If you have taken French or German or Spanish, you know that speaking the language is much harder than reading the language. Speaking is a productive skill. Reading is a receptive skill. Um, listening is a receptive skill. Writing is a productive skill. So let's see, let's go on. Um, so in oracy, there are three things that um, in our, the way that we designed it in Literacy Squared, they're language structures, which a lot of you use in ELD. We need to keep on doing that. We don't need to quit doing that, but we need to connect it to what kids are reading and writing. Uh, vocabulary, we need to expand students' knowledge of words and concepts, and we need to teach them high utility and technical words. Um, and dialogue. We need to plan meaningful uh, ways to elicit from kids ways that we foster conversations and discussions. Okay, Valeria. Okay, then meta language. And meta language is um, the meta language is understanding how language works. So understanding that, um, well, let me go to the third bullet and. Um, there are two types of meta language. One is within language, so that I understand that it's I am, but you are. That's a within language meta linguistic. So I am, but you am isn't what I say. I am, you are. That's within language, within English. But across English, I need to know that I can say soy, and that's I am. I only need one word for two words. That's an across language meta linguistic connection. Um, so meta language in English for English speakers might be something like, what do we need at the beginning of the sentence? We need a capital. Uh, but meta language in English for emerging bilinguals goes something like, in English, we use only one question mark at the end of a sentence, but in Spanish, we use two at the beginning and at the end. This is critical. When you know how language works, then you can use it to propel your own language development. Okay, Valeria. Um, so the teaching of cross-language connections, that's the next one, involves an, a, an explicit awareness of linguistic form and structure. It's a type of contrastive analysis across languages. So it, it means um, knowing things like um, problem and problema. Hmm, that's very interesting. What's the difference between those two words? They mean the same thing. Well, there's an A. Now kids overcorrect sometime and they'll put you know, vowels at the end of words in English way, to try to make Spanish when it doesn't make any, any sense. Uh, but we need to explicitly teach uh, across language connections. Okay, Valeria. 
So what we're trying to do is to help emerging bilingual kids discover commonalities and differences in their two language systems and to analyze syntax, semantic expressions and grammar across and within languages. And I, I use the, the example of the hand-me-downs, uh, but that's an example of um, where semantic expressions don't necessarily translate. And if you try to translate them uh, directly or literally, it won't make any sense in the other language. So from Spanish to English or English to Spanish. All right, go on Valeria. Um, so the cross-language connections, we need to help kids figure out differences. And now you may say to me, oh, in my class, I've got five different language groups. And that's true. And I appreciate that. Now, there are publishing companies. I'm going to mention ARC, the American Reading Company. They have a nice little thick book. They may have it online now since the pandemic, uh, but it's got like the 10 most common languages spoken in the United States. And it's got some good ideas for how to help kids make cross language connections for the things that teachers need to help kids understand, especially in teaching reading. And again, it's not um, comprehensive and it's not all uh, encompassing, but it's at least help for you um, if you don't speak the language of the student in your classroom. Okay, next we go. Um, so meta language, I, I said this, it includes within and across languages. And um, cross language connections uh, has to do with how we, um, again, make sure that kids are aware of both of their languages. Move on, I see I've put, spent too much time. So this is an example of a poster from a, a classroom, a literacy squared classroom, where teachers are explicitly showing kids differences across languages. So in Spanish, you see Crayola Morada, where you put the, the adjective is after the noun, and in English, it goes before the noun. For titles of books, like Pepita habla dos veces, you only capitalize the first letter of a title, but in English, you capitalize all of the letters in the title or the important ones, whatever is an important one. And then an example of how you write a question using two question marks. So um, this is an explicit language comparison using an anchor, an anchor poster. I'm afraid that the, the suggestion is gonna be, you don't have time to do all of that because we gotta do phonics. I am afraid that all of this, what we know is really, really important for helping kids make connections between their two languages, particularly in bilingual settings where we get to use two languages is going to be gone. Because if you take 90 minutes of phonics instruction in English and add 90 minutes in Spanish, that's 180 minutes. That doesn't leave much time for anything else in the school day. Okay, Valeria. Um, we um, like to connect language environments three ways, by the use of bilingual books, by the use of genre. So we're doing a genre unit on poetry where, so we can do that in English and in Spanish. And my big worry about materials adoption um, is that we're not going to be able to do cross language connections or connection language environments because the books in Spanish are gonna to be totally different than the books in English. And if you're gonna to continue to do bilingual education, you're gonna to have to buy new books in two languages, Never mind if you just bought a whole reading set that connects languages well. So go on Valeria, that was the, okay. Um, that was that, connecting language environments and move on. Okay, now. <laughs> Now the fun part. Um, which of these skills, is here's your poll, do you think are strong aspects of the literacy program at your school? Oracy, phonics, writing, meta language, or reading? Very interesting. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm supposed to keep talking. Like I, you know, I like the way so and so. I, you're supposed to keep talking all the time, and I'm instead I'm reading the poll. Um, so 42% of you think that your strongest uh, suit is your reading program because that's the one that you learned about probably in teacher education. That's the one that's been emphasized in your school. But in order to have a robust program, we have to do oracy and writing and meta language. Um, and I see that um, almost a quarter of you think that phonics is a strong component of what you're doing already. Um, and, and some of you feel, feel very good about oracy and that's fantastic. 
um, where we need some work is writing in meta language, right? Um, so that's that's interesting, and I just wanted to know that for my own edification. So let's move on. Um, let's see here. Let's let. Can we move on, Valeria? Okay. Yeah, this is the next poll. Yeah, the next poll. Which of these skills do you think are not as strong? And let's see if the results show what we think they should show as they could be. Okay, so this is interesting. Um, the two things that we know that Lotte kids, second language learners need and come up at a little short in fourth grade are in writing. And this is where most of you are telling us you need help. And where our State Department of Education, because of its emphasis on something called the science, I'm gonna put that in, in air quotes of reading, is likely going to not give you. And they're likely going to discourage people in your school district from giving you more training. You feel you need that. And meta language, meta language. So these are two things that we know that second language learners, Lotte kids, need, and that teachers are telling us they need that are not likely to be in the new war in Afghanistan, the one we've been fighting and not winning. Okay, so. Um, uh, let's see, go on. All right, so now um, these are the references. These are all the references. And now's one of my favorite times of these things. Uh, and we have to get off right at 1030. So I wanna leave plenty of time for questions and answers. So I'm gonna have my friends, Valeria and Wendy, help me with the Q&A. Would um, you like me to stop sharing the screen, Kathy, so you can see? People? Oh, that'd be fantastic. Yes, yeah, so we can see people on the, yeah. Wonderful. Okay, so hi everyone. Are you all having breakfast in your living rooms? And I hope no shoes on the way that you do work all the time. Okay, somebody must be at school because I see masks. Okay, all right, so now what questions do we have? Uh, there was a great question here. Um, yeah, um, let's see here, I teach my fourth graders. And make kids write like that. Somebody had a great question about a kid um, who's a, oh my, where did it go? Where did it go? Um, there was a question about a kid who speaks multiple languages. Oh, here we go. A multilingual learner um, in the second grade and his home language is Marshallese. Would I be able to partner him with another student whose home language is Spanish for an oral language group? I don't know why not. Especially if there's no other kids in your class from the who speak Marshallese. I don't know why not. They probably would have a lot in common. Um, now, uh, people say, why would you put one kid who doesn't speak English together with another kid who doesn't speak English? For that reason, they have a lot in common. The English speaking kids don't have a whole lot of patience for kids who don't speak English. That's sad. Not, then that's not true of every kid. There are a lot of nice kids out there. But um, the, these two kids are likely to be to, to form an, an academic buddy relationship. Um, and and um, absent another option, I think that's probably a good idea. So, okay, what questions do you have? And like I said, my friends Valeria and Wendy are going to help me here. Kathy, they're asking about more information from that resource that you mentioned from the American Reading Company. Yeah, you know what? I did not put that on the re references. I don't know why, but I would be happy. Um, is there a good platform to do that where I just say, here's the reference? Um, yeah, we can probably share it under your session description. We can talk about okay. it. And that's right. where we're going to share the presentation as well, right? We're going yes. to post it uh -huh. there. Yeah, so I'd be happy to put that on there. Okay. And in the app too, we can put it in the Q&A. Yes, I'll be happy to do that. And I'm sorry, I didn't think about that. Yeah, I like it, uh, Jeanette Trujillo. Yes, um, we are realizing that we need to do more oracy for native English speaking kids. 
that we that all kids in our schools need more oral language development, especially oracy. Okay, um, so uh, so do I, I? I don't endorse any particular reading program. So the question about American Reading Company, what I do is I say I think this resource from that company is a really good one, but I wouldn't tell you go out and buy this or tell your principal you got to have that. I just don't do that because I like the. Um, there's an expression in Spanish that say, that goes No hay mal libro en manos de buena maestra. And I really believe that. I think the materials help us, but um, they don't teach, the teachers teach. Um, but what we do need is some sort of an agreement across grade levels. And if I could say one thing that I think maybe has contributed to this concern and the push to teach phonics is this idea that we haven't been very consistent from one grade level to another one in how we teach uh, in our literacy program, particularly in how we teach kids the foundational skills of, of decoding. So um, that probably isn't a, a bad idea to be more consistent. But I'm not gonna, um, American Reading Company is as good as any other reading company, but it's the teacher who makes it work. Okay, Wendy, Valeria, help me, because some of these are long to read. Um, somebody, somebody's asking, are there other considerations we need to keep in mind as we complete the new CDE required science of reading 40 hour course? All of this, is there something that will be pushed from that course we may need to watch out for? Oh, some kind of reading program? Yes, um, I, I hope that's your question. And if it's not, tell me. Yeah, I, I think it's about the CDE requirement that all teachers are gonna have to take a course through yeah. CDE, uh -huh. the science of reading. Yes, so that. Th there's nothing you can do with that uh, about that right now. I mean, it is a state requirement and we do have to live by the, the rules of our state. But I, I do think that um, we could agree that we need a set of talking points. So one of the talking points is show me the research for emerging bilingual kids. Don't tell me good teaching is good teaching. Show me the research. And um, well, it's there. No, no, no. And don't go for research says. Okay. So number two, you can certainly ask the, the question, you know what, I, I really um, would like to know more about how I fit writing into this daily program you're suggesting. Ask it nicely. Don't ask it snarky like I'm asking now. Ask it nicely. But I do think it, there's a set of talking points, uh, particularly about second language learners that need to be asked. Um, and one is, you know, show us the research that says that this works. Um, two, am I, or is, our, is my school district going to have to buy all new books? Because as I understand it, there will be adopted books at the state level and all districts will be required to choose a reading program from one of the um, set list. Is that your understanding, Valeria and Wendy? And the problem with that is that we're a local control state and we never have done that before, except for in tests, you know, High stakes tests were the only time we decided to impose a, uh, a mandate from the state. I was looking through the chat, sorry, I got a little bit distracted. Okay. But I think the question was mostly about is there any cautions that we need to be aware of? Yeah, there's, there's a lot of cautions. cautions. Yeah, and what about, uh, uh, and I, again, I have not seen, what I showed you from New Mexico is from New Mexico. I've not seen a comparable one to, uh, to Colorado, I don't know what's being suggested, but I would be very, very worried about a mandated allocation of time that if you're, that doesn't include oral language and doesn't include writing. I would ask about that right away. If you're in a dual language or a bilingual program, I would be, I would ask, how do you think this is gonna work in Spanish? And again, if it's 90 minutes times two, that, that ain't gonna work. I mean, it, yeah, that's 180 minutes and we haven't even factored in oral language or writing. That's just not, um, and if you ask for research results, ask for them since 2015, <laughs> because if they give you stuff from 2000, that's 21 years ago. Would you go to a doctor who hadn't read an article in 21 years? 
ask for what is new research? What do we know from the last five years, for even from the last 10 years? So what have we known from the last 10 years? And ask the questions about um, emerging bilingual learners and don't take it, good teaching is good teaching and the phonics program will work the same. Can I suggest a good phonics program? That is a really good question. And the answer to that is, is no. As a matter of fact, I read, I just finished reading an article by Louisa Motes. Um, and it, the title of the article is, um, teaching is rocket science, teaching reading is rocket science. And in the, um, the very, you have to read, 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 read. And then the very last thing is, we don't have a perfect phonics program yet. So there's all this, do this, do this, do this, do this, but then the, the uh, requisite materials have not been developed. So my, my guess is that we're gonna fall back on some of the, the old favorites who have been, uh, who none of us like, we'll fall back on the, the Dibbles programs, we'll fall back on the, um, oh, name some of the old phonics programs. Come on, Wendy and Valeria, you have younger minds than I do, help me. Or anybody, help, help. Estreita, we'll fall back on Estreita and programs like that. Uh, but we target for the primary grades only. For the, for the primary grades only. Yeah. And yeah, again, be very, very worried if somebody tells you that this is a K-12 program because phonics was never meant to be taught in yeah, yeah, primary I, school. Uh-huh. Can I ask you, we had a, a comment, a private comment about like the science of reading. It's not just about phonics. It's heavily about phonics. But can you talk a little bit more about? I don't how... think it's about. I don't think it's heavily about science. But let's. Uh, but call it what you will. Um, so um, it is almost exclusively about phonics. So I would like, and then yeah, yeah. Well, yes. Well, we never said you shouldn't teach writing. Okay, just tell us when we're supposed to do this in a day that you've already filled up with letter sounds and letter names. Um, Tell us when we're supposed to do oral language development. How do the two fit together? Um, yeah, the, um, I, yes, I understand. You have to be nicer than, than I am being about all of this. It is not that anyone is saying that we shouldn't teach phonics. That should not be the entire literacy program, especially for kids who are, are carry the label in emerging bilingual kids or English learner as the state calls them. We have about a minute and a half left. Wendy, do you have any, do you see any other questions that Kathy should answer for the whole group? I don't see anything specific here. Um, if you are, I will, plug, we do have another session tomorrow that will also be about um, sort of by literacy and balancing phonics in Spanish and phonics in English and whatnot that I would recommend. Um, if this interests you and you want to dive a little deeper, you can also go to that session. Yeah, tomorrow at 1.30, correct? Mm -hmm. It's the 1.30? I believe yeah, so, Julie's yes. Here. Julie's here, yes, yes, yes. Um, thank you, Kathy, so much for your time. Okay. Thank you for this wonderful session. Thank you, everybody, for attending and your questions and sharing resources. <laughs> Any final remarks, Dr. Escamilla? <laughs> No, just good luck to all of you. Um, we need you, hang in there. I am so happy that most of you are saying that things are going okay and I hope they keep on going okay because like I said, we need you all so badly and the kids need you. So um, stay strong and stay well. Thank you. Thank you, Valeria. We will see you all at the next session at